Welcome to the third season of Between the Lines, the podcast that brings you interviews with some lesser-known Canadian authors and writers. In this season, we will be exploring some of the works of these unknown but talented poets from various locations across this great country. From the breathtaking landscapes of the far north to the bustling downtown city streets, these writers have captured the essence of Canada in their words. In each episode, we will delve into the lives and careers of these fascinating individuals, learning about their inspirations, challenges, and their triumphs. So join us as we discover the hidden gems of Canadian literature and uncover the stories between the lines. Hello and welcome to Between the Lines. On today's show... I will be speaking with the Yukon's own Storm Blakely. Hello, Storm, and welcome to Between the Lines. Hi, Randy. Happy to be here. I'm happy that you've made it all the way from the Yukon. <laughs> <laughs> um, so before, yeah, before we get into the nitty gritty of what we're about to do with the interview, I wonder if you might be able to give the listening audience a brief rundown on who Storm Blakely is and what makes Storm Storm. Sure. Uh, my name is Storm. I'm born in the Yukon, lived, uh, moved away when I was about seven, spent most of my life in BC, and then uh, came back when I graduated high school, and uh, just for a year, and then I was going to go to university, and that was 15 years ago, and I've never left. <laughs> um, this is, this is my home and this is where I am going to stay. I, uh, I live out in the bush in the very rural, rural bush with, uh, my partner, Dave, who is, uh, also a writer and, uh, four dogs and a cat and two goats. So a small zoo, a small zoo. The goats don't live in the house. The goats have their own house outside. And do they play banjo and ride a rail? I wish. I can't teach them anything. They're very stubborn. They're, they're well, smarter that's... than you think they are, but they're very stubborn. Yes, and that's <laughs> the nature of goats. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, for those of you who are wondering, I was referring to the movie Hoodwinked. <laughs> Have you seen that movie? I don't think so. I oh. grew up without television or radio, so I missed out. I have a great big, huge hole on, on most of that. Ah, okay. Well, if you ever get a chance, Hoodwink, it's uh, animated based on a bunch of old uh, nursery rhymes and fairy tales. Okay. Yeah. I will check it out. Thank you. Absolutely. I'm always and, looking for new movies. And part two. Um, so <laughs> is there anything else you want to add to all of that? Um, I don't think so. I mean... I guess I, I was an electrician for a decade, and uh, then since my my I, I wore my body out, and I can't do that anymore. And I'm just waiting for a surgery, hopefully, to uh, get that stuff sorted out. So, what is the nearest proximity uh, to any humanity that you have? Like, you're in the Yukon. Is it Whitehorse, Dawson City? Uh, I'm, my house is about a 30 minute drive out of Whitehorse. Okay. So my bucket, so my bucket list is to make it to Dawson City. Ah, uh, you should, you should. It's it's a it's a place like no other. Well, being poets as we are, which I uh, associate with, my favorite, earliest favorite poet was Robert Service. Yep. From Dawson City. Yeah, and when I was a kid, I had I could recite the spell of the Yukon and the Ballad of Sam McGee. I don't know that yes. I could now. I haven't in years, but when I was a kid, I had them both memorized. And uh, Jack Bible. London, also from, we got Jack London's cabin up there in Dawson. Still. Yes, and uh, the the Burton family. Yep, yep. Uh, grade five was my introduction to poetry, hearing it, and our librarian read The Cremation of Sam McGee. Ah, nice, so, that's a good one. So I fell in love. Uh, in previous seasons, um, at this juncture, I would normally jump right into question period. Uh, but because of the nature of this show being strictly on Canadian poets and their poetry, um, we're going to go, well, I'm going to ask you if you can, uh, if you can read a poem for us before oh, we for sure. begin. 
I have a few ready. Okay. I'll pick a, a shorter one. All right. This one is recent. I have titled it, You've Forgotten My Heart. My love, my love, you've forgotten my heart, dropped it in sand by the sea. May the depths take your ship, death hold you in its grip, and your last thought in drowning be me. My love, my love, I gave you my heart, for you left my home on the reef. May the crabs eat your eyes, the kelp strangle your cries, and your every moment be grief. My love, my love, you've broken my heart, took your new love on the waves. May they scatter your bones, use them as playing stones, no rest in your watery grave. My love, my love, I take back my heart. No more of the land will I roam. May the sharks rend your flesh and the gulls take the rest. For finally, I'm going home. I have no comment for that. <laughs> my poetry is weird. I write weird stuff. That's okay. Weird is, <laughs> is good. Uh, <laughs> what was that line about the crabs taking your eyes? Yeah, may the crabs eat your eyes, the kelp strangle your cries. Love it. That was the first line that came to me, and then the rest of it sort of built around that. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I gotta stop laughing here. <laughs> so that's that's that was interesting. I like it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so Moving into question period then, uh, how old were you when you wrote your first poem? My first poem, I probably can't remember. Like I said, I, I grew up without television or radio or any of that sort of thing. So I, I, I grew up with books. I learned to read very, very young. The, the minute I realized that the markings on page told stories, there was, there was no turning back and I needed to tell my own. So I've been writing as far back as I can remember. The earliest poem that I wrote that I can remember uh, would be in grade four for a Remembrance Day contest. And uh, that is, uh, that one actually got published in the local newspaper in Invermere, BC. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, I won a 50 whole dollars, which in grade four is like, I was rich. So there wasn't any one particular poem that you that inspired you is just this is what you found and you, you loved it pretty much yeah <laughs> well we all come into it in different ways right just like the intro to the show it's you know we come into our paths writing paths in different ways and we all have the same journey but different different paths absolutely and that that, that keeps life interesting if we all came to it the same way if we all did the same things life would be so boring do you have a preferred style of poetry, i.e. sonnet or limerick or haiku? I mean, the list goes on, but do you have a favorite? Um, Like as far as reading, no. I am interested in reading just about any poetry I can, I can get my greedy little eyes on. As far as writing, uh, even if I try not to, I tend towards uh, rhyming, rhyming poetry, which um, is mostly out of style these days in the literary world if not in the world itself but i think that that comes from the fact that uh my my dad is a musician so oh, okay what does right and 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 music right songs that have words are just poetry they're just poetry set to music so most of my poems can actually be sung as well they they do have a tune that goes with them i'm just self-conscious so i'm not going to sing them <laughs> <laughs> Much like myself. I could you belt should. them out there, but I'm sure nobody wants to hear them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's interesting though, that you would say that uh, poetry or song lyrics are just poetry set to music. Because that's, that's what I believe as well. But it took many, many years for me to realize that. When I started yeah. listening to the words, it was like, wait a second. Um, next question. When you write, do you stick to a certain topic for example love nature death or do you just write what comes uh, i'm a write what comes it it sometimes takes me months to write a single poem that uh, the one i read earlier uh came, came very quickly that one came in about a week but i i write what comes so 
I, I, I have poems about all sorts of different things. Uh, my favorite ones do tend towards horror. I, I write horror, horror poetry, <laughs> which is weird and niche, and I'm not quite sure. Like, I know there's an audience for it out there somewhere. I'm not sure there's a paying market for it out there somewhere. <laughs> now, I heard you write horror poetry, right? Yes. That's what I heard. Okay. Yes. Um, well, we're in the ho- uh, Halloween season right now. Uh, at the time of this interview, yeah. and which means that there's a lot of stuff out there dealing with Edgar Allan Poe. Oh, I love Poe. He was one of my early favorites. Still is one of my favorites, actually. But there are I've I've looked and I've looked, and there are not a lot of competitions about writing in the Poe style. And I am looking. This is a, a future announcement, so. I'm looking to maybe start uh, to to starting a uh, poetry, a Poe poetry um, competition to write as Poe, or not as Poe, but in in the style of in the in style the thereof. Style. Yes, yeah, because uh, I I don't think there's enough out there, and I mean, you know, it makes sense to do it every Halloween too. Oh, it's the perfect season for it. That would be that would be great. For so keep your eyes and ears open for for that. Um, yes, I do. I do love Poe myself, and and uh, I think there should be more stylized competitions, you know, on different kind of uh, poets. And he's certainly one that deserves his own niche category. Do you have another poem ready for us? Sure. One second, pull it up here. All right, here we go. This one is called. The Pale Ones. Once I wasn't afraid of the dark, once I was careless and free, till the moon removed the scales from my eyes and the Pale Ones came hunting for me. Now I skirt every shadow with dread and despair, the writhing there catches my eyes. When When the sun sets, I hide within these four walls, for that's when their twisted forms rise. They are eyeless and grinning with two long teeth, many jointed cold grasping claws how i long for the days back when i could sleep with no sound of their chittering jaws here i sit in this corner and shiver and shake watching the light growing dim i can hear them scratching outside my door and soon they will let themselves in and that is that one that's that's kind of creepy i like it (laughs) yes uh, yep yep another super creepy one um, I, I write weird poetry. No, it's not weird. <laughs> it's not weird. Um, are you familiar with the, um, I can't even remember the name of it right now, but there is a, a yearly competition up in the Yukon, writing competition, that uh, actually they're a member of my group, uh, Canadian Creative Writers, and they hold a, uh, a writing contest every year, uh, with poetry, prose, whatever short story and they they give you kind of a topic to write on or whatever like that uh are you familiar with this one uh, i think so but i'm also drawing a blank uh what's what's coming to mind is uh the Nakai competition but i believe that's screenwriting and no that's I've not never, it. I, yeah so that that's not the one but that's the name that's coming to mind so no, I'm, I'm gonna have to look that up <laughs> uh, you know what i'll actually send you a link to it oh appreciate it thank yeah, you yeah yeah you know um there's uh, another person in our group in my group i should say uh you're in my group as well aren't you yep yeah okay, that's so. uh, that's where i we we first got together read this yeah fantastic um and she her and her husband used to go up to the yukon because uh, he did um panning for gold oh yeah he'd been doing that for years but she's the one that told me about this competition and uh it, it seems kind of uh Something on Eighth Street or Fourth Street. Anyway, I'll send you the link. It's it's a, a neat little contest, and uh, I think the grand prize is a, a gold nugget. Oh, that would be great! Isn't that I cool? don't actually own any Yukon gold. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> um, in your opinion, is poetry dying, or do you think there is still enough interest in it to keep writing it? Oh, I 100% think it is alive and thriving and well. It is 
changed form that from what it was, you know, a decade ago, but what was a decade ago is a different form than what was a hundred years ago. Are we going to see lots of sonnets and things these days? Probably not. Those sorts of things are, are, are falling out of style and all of that. But like I said, music, music with words to it, it is all poetry. Your hip hop, your heavy metal music, your pop music, your country music, all of that, it is poetry. It is just poetry set to music. And I don't think humanity will ever, ever be done playing music and writing songs. Fair enough. However, the popularity of poetry in its purest form of poetry, I think is cyclical. And it, you know, if you go back to the Renaissance, poetry was at the height of everything, you know, um, liter literature. Right. And yeah. then it dies out and another form picks up and it comes back. And the sixties was a big resurgence of poetry as well. And, you know, uh, to me, poetry, there'll always be poets, but it's popularity wanes and, and resurges. And, you know, I think we're in a, in this point of the cycle where it's not as popular as it once was, but it's still there. Agree oh, yeah. or disagree. I'm inclined to agree with that. Like poetry as just straight spoken poetry. Yeah. There, there's going to be a pendulum, right? Sometimes it's very popular and then it swings down and goes to the other side. But as far as, as I would argue poetry in its purest form is songs. I think we were making music and singing our stories long before we were just reciting them. Even if it was, you know, banging rocks together in, as Neanderthals in caves. That would be I, me. I, I would, yeah, I, I, I would, I would think like poetry is still wildly popular because music is wildly popular, and uh, you know, I've, I've, I've had the argument with some people that not all music is poetry, um, and that I will, I'll, I'll, I'll share a story about my dad, who's a, a mostly folk and blues musician, but he did um, uh, an arts in the park program here in the Yukon in Whitehorse for 18 years. They're, they have an artist and a musician playing for an hour between noon and one every day during our very, very short summers. And he had a group of young hip hop folks come up once. And uh, they, they, you know, as, as a joke, asked, asked him if he would like to come and rap with them. So my dad got up there on stage and took the mic and rapped. There are strange things done beneath the midnight sun by the men who moil for gold because mm -hmm. rap is just poetry rap and hip-hop and all of that is just poetry mm -hmm. with very complicated rhyme schemes and very specific rhythms and it is wildly popular and poetry forever will be that's uh that's <laughs> that's an interesting story actually <laughs> <laughs> oh it cracks me up it's one of my favorite stories about my dad yeah i almost don't know how to follow that up um <laughs> <laughs> sorry <laughs> <laughs> um so, yeah, uh, well, then let's just go to the next question, and I'll come back to what I was thinking. Uh, who do you write for? I write for me. Like I said, I, I, I know there's an audience out there. There's an audience out there for everything, everything you can imagine, everything you could possibly write. There is an audience there. It's sometimes hard to find. Um, but, yeah, I don't know that there's much in the way of a paying market uh, for weird, creepy horror poetry. Uh, so I, I write for me. It, it, it sits in my brain and it chews at me and it haunts me and it gnaws at me until I get it down on paper. Okay. So so if, 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 if other people enjoy reading it, that's great. And I'm super happy. And, you know, everyone wants their, you know, I can't say everyone. Most people want their stuff to be enjoyed and everything. And that is fantastic, but it is mostly, I need to get it out because otherwise I can't let it go. <laughs> well, if you don't get it out, there isn't room for any more. Exactly. It just sits in there and holds and takes up space so that I need that space for other things. <laughs> Earlier you said it could take you weeks, months to, to write a poem or whatever, to, or to complete a poem. Yeah. Um, so would it be safe to assume then that an idea will come and you'll write till the idea is gone. And if it's incomplete, you'll set it aside. And when the inspiration comes back, you'll pick it up. Yes. I have um, one of the, I have, cause you, you would ask me for choose three poems. So I, 
I pulled up my four favorites. I probably won't do one of them because it is quite long. It is very, very long, so I'll probably do the shorter one. But that particular one, I wrote the first verse, and then I could not figure what figure out what where it was going. I did not know what else there was <laughs> until probably a year later. And then after that, over the course of about three days, I managed to hammer it out. But it was three days of me doing, like, basically nothing else. <laughs> you know, outside of work and chores and things. But every time I sat down, it was like, you know, oh, I'm going to check my email. No, I need to write this down. <laughs> Do you edit your poetry? Uh, as I go. I, I I read it out loud. It has to It has to make sense. It has to have the right rhythm. Sometimes spoken, it doesn't have the right rhythm because, like I said, a lot of my stuff is intended to be sung. Um, but, yeah, I, I do edit my poetry. I'll, I'll, I'll finish it, and then I'll put it away, come back in a week, read it over again, fix what needs to be fixed, put it away, come back after a couple of weeks and do the same thing again until I'm happy with it. Hmm. I started or tired of it. Or tired of you. <laughs> I started writing poetry in 1979, and you know, life went on about it, and you know, whatever. I wrote and wrote and wrote, and then finally, after I started losing my vision, I took a course through the Hadley School for the Blind and Visually Impaired called uh, the Elements of Poetry, and my instructor uh, suggested that I find an old poem. And either edit it or rewrite it. And I thought that was just crazy. What? You're supposed to edit poetry? Because it was always my belief that the way it comes out is the way that it's intended. I don't know where I got that from, but that's what I believe. And so I did it anyway. And I was able to take a, a two-page song slash poem and condense it into one page. And I, you know, I, I like the improvement, but I still like the original as well. Yep. Um, so that's why I asked that question. If you edit your poetry. Oh, I always do. I always do. But, uh, again, like that for on my end, I, when I was a teenager, I didn't, it was very much stream of emotion, stream of consciousness, just pouring out what was, what was going on in the page. Uh, as I have been, I don't want to say a little more serious about it. Um, uh, I don't. I'm lacking the I'm lacking the way to do that. As as I am trying to get better at it, I guess uh, I do. I do. I very much. I very much edit my poetry. That 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 metaphor doesn't work in here. I rip it out. I will use it somewhere else. If I really like it, I'll keep it written down and I'll plug it in somewhere else where it fits. But uh, again, like with with my, with background in music and with most of my poetry being with a specific rhyme and a specific rhythm intended to be set to music it absolutely has to be edited otherwise it doesn't work just out of curiosity how many how many poems do you think that you've lost over the years that you lost the notebook or whatever means you recorded them oh thousands yeah eh? yeah yeah thousands of them I, I I know for a fact I had um I had very bad mental health issues in school, and uh, poetry was a lot of how I could get deal with that, how I how I worked through it, how I how I dealt with that. Um, but going back to it uh, brought me back to the same place. Reading it over again years later, when I was happy, got me feeling exactly the way that I did. Uh, so I burned it. I burned my notebooks. I had I had a, I had a fit one day and I just I had enough and I burned like three notebooks full of poetry. <laughs> I regret it. I should not have done that. Well, it was, it was the moment that needed good. to Lots happen. Of them right? were probably crap. Some of them were probably good. <laughs> but at the time, you needed to do that. At the time, that is what I needed to do to to help deal with with some of the trauma and get the healing going. Yeah. I'm not well. doing it again. <laughs> Not on purpose, anyway. Not on purpose. That's fair. That's fair. Not on purpose. Will I do that again? <laughs> when when I started writing poetry, that was what I used it for, was to to just deal with all my angst and my issues. And it was a and I kept it to myself. Are you were you the type of poet that kept it all to yourself after you've oh. written it? You didn't share it with anybody, or hundred percent, hundred percent. None of none of that stuff anybody else ever got to saw. 
my my stuff since then my, I, in my in my adult life absolutely i share it because i i need the feedback and i i like to know what works and what doesn't and what other people think and that that helps me learn and learn and grow the craft right but yeah as as a teenager no none of those saw the light of day only for me only for me <laughs> I, ac- I accidentally left one of my notebooks out one day and a friend of mine picked it up and started reading it oh, much no. to my <gasps> and uh <clears throat> And my friend turned around and says, why aren't you sharing this? Because you know what? I feel exactly like this at times. And then when I heard that, I was like, maybe they're going to benefit from reading it. Or there's a way that, do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, it so might, might be helpful for someone else. Yeah. Do you think you missed out on that by burning? Or does it matter? Oh, I definitely missed out on that, right? Like if nothing else maybe I would have found somebody who felt the same way. So I wouldn't have felt quite so alone. Um, but I, I don't regret it. Like it, it, it is what it is. I'm not, I, I'm not dwelling on the past in it, about it anymore. I'm sorry. My, my potato of a dog is bothering me and I might need to let him outside in a minute. Well, that's fine. <laughs> we're not, we're not timed and I can edit it. Sorry. I'm back. I'm back. No worries. We got our first proper snow of the year, so we're very excited to go out and play in it. Ah, <laughs> you're in darkness, are you not? No? Oh, pretty close. Uh, we don't get white horses still far enough south that we don't get the, the weeks of darkness. That's We're below the Arctic Circle. Okay. Uh, but we do get short days. Come December, in the shortest days, the sun rises about 11.30. And sets by four. Okay, so you're not really, truly in the land of the midnight sun. No, no, not 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 quite. Even Dawson isn't not quite. Yeah, <laughs> very close, but not not quite. So while you just stepped away, I just thought that would be the perfect opportunity for me to inside uh, insert the Jeopardy music. <laughs> yeah, that would be great. <laughs> um. Uh, who do you, okay, we already covered who do you write for. Um, what are the benefits and challenges with self-publishing of poetry? Uh, for me, on my end, that's going to be marketing. I am not good at selling myself. I am not good at marketing myself. And there is a, there, there is an old joke that your, your friends and family will never read your blog, you know, <laughs> That's that's not what they're gonna do. That's not how that's gonna go down. So it's uh, it's it's getting it out there so that people can read. My my partner pub self published a book of poetry, and I think I am one of three people that ever bought it. You know, he doesn't care. He proved his point and can now say I'm a published author. <laughs> but yeah, mar- marketing, marketing, getting it sold, getting getting the word out to if you're not good at that then it's going to be a very hard time which is part and parcel why i'm doing this podcast is to introduce whoever's listening to lesser known canadian authors and writers and and for this season poets and to give that uh, give the poets the writers an opportunity to be heard and to be discovered and i think it's very very important and uh the feedback that I've been getting, like I said, this is for season three. So um, clearly there's been a, enough interest uh, uh, by people wanting to, you know, get out there. And so if this, if this helps, I'm, I'm very happy that it helps. Oh, very much. And, and, and appreciated. Like that's, there's, there's so many, there's so many people out there that are, that, that should get read, that should get heard, that have a really hard time just breaking past that to get heard, you know? It comes down to the big five publishers too, right? I mean, they, they say, you need to read this, you need to read this. But, and I don't mean this as a slight against those big five publishers, but, <clears throat> excuse me, um, I've read some of those things and then I've read Things that, you know, from people like me and you and others like that who, who self-publish. And, I mean, that's a lot better than some of the stuff that the, the big five put out. So I think yeah. it's unfair, but, I mean, you know. Uh, I they... think they, 
as the establishment get, um, they get stuck, right? They get stuck in their rut. This is what we like because this is what sells. And then they have a hard time breaking out of it because they're, they're the establishment, they're the industry, they're, they're what's been dictating what's good and what's not for so long. Yeah. You know? They try to set the, <laughs> set the mark for everybody. Yeah. And sometimes that mark isn't really worth, in my opinion, my opinion only, you can write me emails and whatever, but in my opinion, some of that stuff isn't worth the paper it's written on. Well, I think it's all a matter of taste. Just because something isn't to my taste doesn't mean that it's bad. I don't like horror movies. That doesn't mean horror movies are bad. That just means that they're not to my taste. I'm a really big fan of heavy metal music. Other people don't like heavy metal music. That doesn't mean that they're wrong. That just means like that is not to their taste. And that's fine. It is not to everyone's taste. Okay. But again, if we all like the same things, life would be really boring. True enough. So uh, the listening audience cannot see my face right now, and uh, but I'm looking, I'm looking at Storm, who just admitted to being a, a lover of heavy metal, and <laughs> from what I can see of, of Storm, not the heavy metal person that I would imagine. <laughs> I, I, so I love metal too. I don't usually my hair is up. <laughs> I, I, I love head. metal as well, so it's fallen down a little bit here. But yeah, no, I, I in high school I was very goth. I wore all the all the heavy black makeup and and all of that, and uh, I had to stop wearing a lot of that stuff when I got into construction because there's just you know there's no space for for the big long spiky chokers when I'm crawling through someone's attic, you know. So, I'm still goth in my heart. I'm just not goth visually anymore. So you're young enough that <laughs> goth was a thing in high school? Oh, yeah. Is goth, well, goth hasn't been around all that long. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. I mean, arguably, like, like there's some, un, under that term, I guess, under that specific term, but the, 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 the mentality and all of that stuff, very much, very much so. Poe, right? Like <laughs> we talked about Poe, and that that man wrote some goth poetry and some goth stories. <laughs> oh, absolutely, absolutely. I just think of uh, you know Mary Shelley and and you know Frankenstein and Dracula and yep. all those yep. things. I mean, they fit right into that as well. Um, yeah, fantastic. <laughs> oh, now I've got my cat here. Do you ever hope to publish one day traditionally or? Uh, like a single poem or a chapbook or or a oh absolutely yeah. if uh, if I if I could get published if I if I could find an audience and get paid for for my weird creepy stuff that would be amazing that would make my day <laughs> one day one day one day <laughs> all right so uh, most people who are listening know the way this show goes when I interview people I give them a list of questions they choose their seven. And we go on, and there's always the mysterious eighth question that the guest never knows. So this is that part. So here we go. If you had a chance to say something to the person who first got you interested in writing poetry, what would you say to them? I would say thank you. That would be that would be my thing. It was. Uh... It would be my grandmother. She's the one who taught me how to read. We read all of the classics, Heidi and Black Beauty and National Velvet and The Wind in the Willows. And I was so proud when I was old enough and I could follow along enough that I got to read the dialogue. It's a big deal. And uh, she, she passed away a number of years ago at the ripe old age of 96. Nice. And I would, tell, I would tell her thank you and that I loved her very, very much and that my life has been better because of that because well, she of just teaching heard you. me how to read and then encouraging me she never read my po she never read my poems but every day after school when i was there angry and scribbling away in my book she was supportive well she just heard you <laughs> i hope so to to go back to something you said earlier about family and friends and um reading or buying your your books or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they, they make all the promises. Oh, I'll buy that. I'll buy everything you write. And it, it, yeah, there's so many promises that are broken that, uh, <laughs> uh, 
Uh, how many, well, we'll get to that in a second, but I'm sure you've got at least one book out there. No. No? No, I have, uh, to date, I have that one poem that got published as uh, when I was in grade four, which technically counts, but I don't really count it because that was years <laughs> ago and I'm so much better at that. So uh, what advice would you give someone who thinks, quote unquote, thinks they might be or they might have a knack for writing poetry? Do it. Do it. Write it. Get it down. Get it out there. Send it out there. Even if, like, ev- everywhere you can possibly submit it to, submit. You'll go through a million and one rejections, but one day, one day you'll find the people that do actually want it and do like it and will read it. Yep. If you don't write it, nobody will get a chance to read it. Yeah, and if you don't submit, like, uh, I'm not I'm not a hockey player, but there's a there's a hockey quote from somebody. I I don't sports ball, but I you miss a hundred percent of the shots you don't take. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so write it, write it down, write it down, edit it, show it to people, submit it everywhere. You will find people who like it. There is somebody out there who is an audience for whatever it is that you write. You just have to find them and that might take a little work. Would you say you're shy about showing your stuff? No, no, no I, uh, I have a website, and I when I when I get tired of my stuff getting rejected, I put it up there. <laughs> or well, that's not fair. There there are some that I put up there that I never submitted anywhere else because I I, I just didn't know of a place that even might vaguely be interested. But I I, I want my stuff read, so it goes up on my site. <laughs> Dealing with that that whole rejection thing, I've. Uh... On Facebook with the various writing groups that, I mean, you and I are in. I mean, I'm, yeah. well, I think we're in two together. Yeah, I think we share the two, yeah. Yeah, and uh, I see over and over and over again people, oh, another rejection letter, you know, and humming and hawing and whining and crying about it. But I don't, you know, um, I think I think the it's, it's a wrong attitude to have about uh, being rejected because you know what it just doesn't fit with that particular group of people or you know what they're trying to do doesn't mean it's not good but that's that seems to be the way people take a rejection like, oh I'm no good that's yeah. not the case do you agree with that 100% agree with that it's 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 not that it's bad it's not that it it's just that it's not to that person's group particular taste or it didn't fit for their particular theme that they were going for at any given time it's a rejection is not necessarily a reflection on our work i've been um trying to learn more about it i'm a i'm a slush reader for for a magazine i'm not allowed to talk about the stories and stuff that i read but good god hundreds hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of submissions per month and you like the the editors have to be harsh. They have to be harsh because they just have too many, and you can't you can't publish them all. And all of my dealings with and you know various emails back and forth with editors, they wish they could. They really do. You know they like all the stories, and they really wish that they could publish more, but they can't. You know you get four hundred and eight submissions, and you can only publish eleven. Yeah. <laughs> It's not that the rest. It's not that the rest of them are bad. It's just that they 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 didn't work at that particular place and that particular point in time. And uh, yeah, no, I you do have to have a thick skin. You can't let the you can't let the rejections get get under you and needle you. Like I think Stephen King said, he had like a filing cabinet of reject of rejection slips. I might be paraphrasing that, but like many, 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 many. And he's you know he's a world world famous now yeah you just you have to be able to get past that and um i think a lot of people have imposter syndrome about it you know maybe i'm not as good maybe i'm maybe i'm not good and i that that's a harder one to get over uh we all have to do that in our own particular way but don't 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 let the rejections get you down they're they're a part and parcel of the process because we have a million million stories and poems and whatnot being submitted out there and of course they're not all going to you know this is not we have so many more places we can submit to so we have so many more people who can 
all we can do is write the best we can and keep trying, keep trying, keep trying. I have, I have a story that I 100%, I really, really, really think it's really, really good. And it has been, I've, I've submitted it almost 50 times and I've been rejected about 50 times. Yep. <laughs> one day I will find the place for it one day. Or but in the meantime, it's not that it's bad. It's just that it doesn't fit wherever it is, or maybe the editor didn't feel it that day, or maybe the slush reader was like, you know, this this isn't going to fit. There's there's a million reasons why. The last reason we should think is that our work is bad because it's not. It's probably not. The other side of that too, though, is whoever you submit it to, uh, whoever's reading it, they might be having a bad day. Yep. And what you've written, it just doesn't sit with them that day. Yep. And another day they might be like, wow, what a brilliant story. Yep. But right. that There's one it. day. Um, yep. So I, uh, I'm, I'm predominantly a poet, but I'm trying to start with, start writing short stories and stuff like that. And so there's a lot of flash fiction contests out there. And so, you know, you submit and you wait for the response and your name's not on the, uh, any of the long list, the short list or the finalist. Yeah, they all end with list. Anyway. <laughs> um, but I don't take it as a rejection. I just, you know what? Okay. So that didn't fit for this particular thing. Doesn't mean it's not good. So what I've started to do is gather all my short stories together and I'm going to publish my own book. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, the title is going to be called in not so many words because they're all flash, flash fiction, but oh, that's <clears throat> clever as fuck. What's sorry, that? sorry, I swore. I said that's clever as F word. I don't know if I'm allowed to swear. I'm trying to be good. I swear a lot. I'm trying to be good today. You know what? I get a lot of people <laughs> who say the exact same thing. And for whatever reason, they, they come on to the show and they're able to, you know, and, you know, those things are, you're human, right? Yeah. <laughs> Mostly. Okay. I mean, I don't know. I'm, I'm a ginger. I've got the red hair and the freckles. So I'm like demi-human. Barely. <laughs> I'm not going to comment. <laughs> not going to comment. Uh, we're going to go into what I call shameless plugging, which may or may not benefit you or, or whatever, but we're going to, we're going to do it anyway. So what books or poems do you currently have available um, on the market and where can we find them? Uh, like I said, I don't, I don't actually have any books or anything for sale. I do have a blog that no one will read. No, I kid, we'll get, I kid. We'll get to People that. People do sometimes read it. That's what this is for. Uh, there is a lot of nonfiction is how it started. I started the blog for nonfiction stuff about the world and whatnot and uh it also became a place for me to post my uh my short stories and my poetry so that is it's called a topic for another time because everything is interconnected uh and the website is www.stormblakely.com so www.stormblakely.com no e after the k Nope, B-L-A-K-L-E-Y, to uh, steal a joke from my partner. Um, back in the day, I must have had an illiterate ancestor because my name is not spelled how it's pronounced. No, definitely not. <laughs> so I've been hey. typing it wrong the whole time. I'm so sorry. No. <laughs> uh, are you currently working on anything? Uh, and if so, how close is it to being complete? Oh, I'm working on lots of things. I, uh, I don't think I have a poem on the go. I had uh, I had you forgotten my heart stuck in my head and I needed I needed to get that down. So since then I'm working on a bunch of short stories, uh, including one in a in a different writing group I'm on. So not not one of the Facebook ones, but one I found on Reddit. Uh, someone posed the question one day, uh, "What would language look like without pronouns?" And somebody said, well, it would be, you know, it would break language. And I would, no, it wouldn't. No, it wouldn't. So I am writing a short story entirely without pronouns. And it is an exercise in imagination. Like having to phrase things without using pronouns is interesting, but it can be done. It just, we're not used to it. 
it's like writing without using the word that. It can be, yeah. But um, I, 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 I am a Trekkie. <laughs> Yay! I love, I love, I love Star Trek. <laughs> Um, and what first came to mind when somebody said, what would a language without pronouns look like, uh, was the Next Generation episode where they encountered a species that uh, communicated entirely in metaphors, Tarmok and Jalad at Tanagra. That is a sentence that tells a story without pronouns. <laughs> it's entirely possible. <laughs> Chaka when the walls fell. Again, to them... That is a sentence that tells a story without pronouns. It can be done. It would just be very, very different than we're used to. No argument here. <laughs> yeah. So it's <laughs> taking me a while. This one is taking me a while because I am essentially like, this is the sentence I want to say. Now, how do I rework it? Because I have, you know, one in there or I or me or those, you know, I have to get rid of that. I need to that can't be in there because I'm having a no pronoun story. So you're going to win that argument then? Maybe. <laughs> Probably not. That particular group doesn't allow, it's uh, it's mostly for discussions. We're not allowed to plug our own work, which, you know, fair enough. Um, so it, 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 it probably, the person I was having the argument with will probably never actually see it, but I'm proving the point to myself anyway. <laughs> in, the, in some cases, that's all that really matters. Well, it's, it, it's it's making my my brain work in a different way. It is making my my writer muscle work in a way that it is not used to, and that can only be good. Exercising the imagination, right? Exercise of flexing that writing muscle and, and getting out of what I'm used to and trying something different, and that's only going to be good for, for me trying to get better at what I do. So if you were to go, I, I, I'm assuming that you keep all your writing on your computer somewhere? Yep. So if you were to look at all your files, how many poems would you say you currently have? Uh on this on this particular laptop, maybe a dozen. This oh, okay. is a this is a new laptop. I, I had one and then it broke. Okay, so let's uh, round up was, to the and I was thousand. without one for like two years. I, I was I was without uh any sort of writing other than other than, you know, my pencil and paper, which is how I do most of my poetry. I write most of my nonfiction and fiction on the computer. I am a sucker for pen and ink and not a ballpoint. I'm, I'm, I'm fancy. I like my fancy ink for so writing poetry. A quill and ink I wish, I wish if I could get my hands on a quill pen, I would be the happiest day you have ever seen. I would be just <laughs> beside myself. <laughs> That's awesome. So in general, then, can you put a roundabout figure on how many poems you currently have? Currently have? Oh, God. In all of my various binders and things, probably yeah. over 100. You know, most of, most of which won't see the light of day. Uh, the, the ones that I think are good, right, because not, not everything we do is good. But the ones that I think are really good, I, I will type up and save on save on the computer and then back it down into a hard drive. Back up your writing. Don't don't burn it. Don't lose it. Back it up. <laughs> I guess where I was going with that question though is so you, you want to publish a collection one day. So are you waiting for the right amount of quote unquote in your eyes good poetry? Or because think about it. What you might not think is good, somebody else may go, I love this. Yeah. And that's fair. You know, there's there there's something to that. It's, I think it's mostly that um like I have three binders spanning about fifteen years worth of worth of like and they're not organized. Like there's are torn out pages or shit that I scribbled down on napkins while I was drunk at the bar back when I drank, you know, like <laughs> And I, it's, it's, it's just that it's going to be an undertaking to sit down and spread it all out and, and, and go through it all. I challenge you to do it though. You should do it. I appreciate it. I, I will one day. We recently moved and it is, we are down to the last few boxes and those boxes are sitting out. I made a point of like not stuffing them in a closet or somewhere. They're in a corner of the room where I have to see them every day. And those boxes are the ones with those binders. And they're so, not going to move until you tackle the problem. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> one day. One day. Well, I mean, I've got 10 self-published books. Oh, 
Oh, hey, good for you. And that's 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 a lot. That's since, crazy accomplishment. Since 2013. Oh wow! <laughs> Holy. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, I, you know what? Um, and I, I say this in just about every interview I do, whether it's about poetry or not, is I, I don't write for profit. I profit from writing. Yeah. Right. And so I, I'm just putting it out there because I also say in some of my books, I don't necessarily write because I have something to say, but rather because there may be something you need to hear. Well, that's a lovely way to look at it. I, yeah. Like I, I I'm, I'm with you. I don't write for profit. I, I write because, my bank I, account because I like to get to it that. down and I would like people to read it. Um, if, if I could make money, at, at my writing, that would be great. That, you know, that would be, that would be absolutely amazing, but that's not the goal. Going in there with that as the goal is, is a good way to demoralize ourselves because it's so damn hard <laughs> to get published and make money at, it, right? Like most authors still have to have a day job. You know, yep. they're like, not, not everybody is going to be Stephen King. You know, not not everybody is going to be able to do that. Nope. I see your cat's tail. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I sent her down and she complained at me. Um, <laughs> so when people respond to something that you've written, how does that make you feel? Oh, so happy. So happy. If if it makes if it makes them smile, right? Like you you smiled and laughed at, at some of my poetry today, and that felt absolutely great inside. That is that is all I am hoping for. If... Do you believe that negative criticism, critiquing, is good or bad? Depends on how it's done. Lots of people are really, really, really bad at criticism. I hated this. It's not a criticism. That's an opinion. You know, this this metaphor could use work it's a little janky that's criticism and that helps us be better we learn by making mistakes we don't learn by making everything perfect the first time we learn from making mistakes so we have to make mistakes but to learn from them we need to know what those mistakes are when i said when i share my stuff i say you know what i don't care if you like it or not that doesn't help me that's an opinion yeah what makes you think what makes you feel these are the things that I'm after, and I think most writers are after when they want somebody to read it. They, I don't like it. Well, why don't you like it? Tell me that. Otherwise, yeah. it, it means nothing. Yeah. Why you don't like it, that is helpful, right? Like, why don't you like it? Well, it was creepy. That's fair. <laughs> you know, that this might not be a poem for you then. <laughs> but just straight, I don't like it, is, isn't helpful. If you had to choose one of your poems as a favorite, which one would it be and why? Hmm. That is my really long one. It is called The Passage. This is the one that took me about a year to write. It is up on my blog. Uh, and it is very much written in the style of Robert Service. I am telling a different type of story, but that is, and as soon as you read it, if you know anything about service, you'll know. My rhyme scheme and rhythm was very much inspired by my service. Can I ask you to read it right now? Sure. I will warn you, it is very long. That's fine. <laughs> uh, we're not limited by time. Okay. Give me a second. I will pull it up here. All right. The Passage. A winter's night not long ago, when northern lights did dance and glow, out on the ice, an owl called thrice, the north wind ceased to blow. With swiftest speed, the silence fell, otherworldly, a cold, dark spell. The dogs a quake, myself a shake, I long to flee pell-mell. A darkened shape beyond my tent, its painful form, withered, bent. Somewhere out there, with icy stare, it reeked dark intent. Out of the ice it came to be, exuding pain and misery. What creature this of cold and mist, why come here now for me? A spirit of the boundless waste, of cunning patience, rarely haste. This beast of cold, of ages old, of menace, forward paced. The world was still, there was no sound. A jagged hulk stood tall, icebound, 
and in its eyes I saw the cries of thousands it had drowned. It towered as to reach the stars, its frozen flesh carved out in scars, ripped out by groans of splintered bones shaped so unlike to ours. With every step I shook with dread, within my tent I wished I'd fled. This winter beast, somehow unleashed, strode slowly past my sled. Closer came, and closer still, emanating, deathly chill. I could not see why it chose me to close in for the kill. What crimes, I thought, did I commit to land on creatures ghastly writ? What had I done under the sun, and how could I acquit? The dogs lay still there in the snow, silhouettes in eerie, eldritch glow. I feared them dead, each furry head. It approached upon the flow. I was consumed by utter fright. The awful thing blocked all my sight, but it strode past, with me aghast, it walked into the night. No spared glance or single gaze, not for me from eyes ablaze, it did not turn, and so I learned a lesson for my days. Into the night it disappeared, across the ice it never veered, that ancient god, broken nod, that all souls knew and feared. As it vanished from my view, my ordeal now almost through, the wind brushed back with throaty crack and knocked me half askew. The dogs then put up such a fuss, singing out the fear in us. I hitched the sleigh without delay, what will remain turned treasonous. I remember not that wild ride. I came home tired, glassy-eyed, coward and meek. I could not speak, no matter how one cried. I realized then with the morn, I did not merit even scorn. What I'd leaned from that dark fiend has left me old and worn. A deity from elder age, comprised of death, of frozen rage, eternal ken, cares not for men, freed from ancient cage. What folly, then, to think that I could ever rise to occupy a god's own thoughts to us just knots of eons flowing by. And that is it. I'm sorry, it's very long. (laughs) <laughs> I, I I I was waiting for more. No, that is that's brilliant. Thank that you. That is fantastic. I'm, I'm super proud of that one. It took me a long time, <clears throat> a very complicated rhyme scheme. <laughs> yes, I have I have attempted to write in the style of Robert Service many many times, um, and uh, I could do it no justice like you just did. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> that no, Great. seriously, that is fantastic. <laughs> I mean, I'm not trying to tickle your ears because I can't see them, but um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know what I'm trying to say, though. That that is yep. that's fantastic. Um, yeah, you should publish that. <laughs> I hope really so. Should. It is uh, it is up. Like I said, it is up on my blog, and the, thus, for most publications that I have looked into, counts as published. Like if someone you. is calling for unpublished work. That counts blogs, that counts Patreons, that counts those sorts of things. I did try. I did try. I spent two years sending that one out until I was like, no, people need to read it. So I put it up on my blog. Some of the places that I've looked, though, a blog is not, a personal blog is not considered publication. Interesting. In in some circles. So. Yeah, that's fair. Like I said, uh, a lot of the places I look at, specify in their guidelines always check the guidelines when submitting (laughs) advice for new writers always 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 check (laughs) they're very specific and if you do not follow the guidelines the editor will throw your shit out they don't have time for this they have 408 that they have to read and on the first page you didn't follow the guidelines next (laughs) i'm sorry it said 200 words not 200 pages yeah (laughs) (laughs) okay so where can people connect with you facebook email Snail mail, TikTok, Instagram, the list seems to go on and on, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Social media where the world has become a fascinatingly smaller place with, with the advent of the internet. And it is, it is amazing. What a time to be alive. What a time to be alive. Uh, I am on Facebook under, under my name, Storm Blakely. I am on Twitter. Uh, usually most of the time with my own name, I currently have a Halloween. Uh, but there I am at V E D R A V E N. And, uh, I did relatively recently start a TikTok where I have that, uh, which is again V E D R A V E N S on that one on TikTok. And that is mostly where I am. 
Instagram, I guess, but that is, I'm not on there a whole lot and it's tied to Facebook. So. Yeah. I'm not even going to tackle TikTok. Yeah, no, it's, it's a lot. I'm not good at it. I'm just new still. <laughs> one, one of the people I interviewed for season two, actually her post just came up. Her interview just came up. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, she's hired a tween to do her TikTok for her. <laughs> oh yeah. No, that's the smart thing to do, man. That is, uh, that is going to be the platform of the future. That is, that is where all the youngs are going. That is the rest of them are all going to fade away. And that is going to be the platform of the future. Cause that is, that is where the young folks want to be. My son tells me and reminds me all the time that dad Facebook is for old people. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> we, have, we, have, we have what we have Gen X on Twitter. We have people older old. than that on, on Facebook and uh, people younger than that on the, on the TikTok Gen Z. Yeah, I guess Twitter is mostly Gen X and, and, and millennials like me. <laughs> You're a millennial? Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to be 30. I'm bad at math. I'm going to be 34 or 35 this year. I don't know. I don't celebrate my birthday. <laughs> okay. okay. Come on, kitty. <laughs> my son uh, is turning 24 so i guess he falls into that millennial as well yeah just just on the edge there right yeah. on the cusp of it yeah um so uh, i gave you an opportunity to read your long poem yep. and now i will say before we conclude our talk would you be so kind as to give us another one so you're short one now okay uh this one is called the standing stone out on the haunted moors they stand, a desolate landscape they command. The thick white fog that ebbs and flows envelops all and swiftly grows. It surges up in heaving waves, briefly revealing shallow graves, long overgrown by root and turf, bones moldering encased in earth. Poor starving souls reduced to moans, flit fruitlessly among the stones. They're sad forever, eternally bound, in winter winds their voices sound. The cold wind sighs among the grass, white-coated stalks now ring like glass, devouring souls counting the lost, ghostly eldritch limbed in frost. Above this place, moon goddess smiles at those forsaken held by her wiles. The stones stand tall in silver light, their defense those consumed by fright. This land is hers from earth to sky, its guardians those souls who cry out for release from this damned state, all human in them turn to hate. They long to once again feel warm, to hold a shape, to have a form. All that was life is stripped from them to adorn the moon's cold diadem. This wintry crown she wears year-round, all those who come therein are bound. Trespassers she will not abide, where this world and the fae collide. Jealously she hides the lore, secrets locked forevermore, till someone sounds the singing stones and the sacred words in tone. So I envision two things when I when I hear this, either something like Stonehenge or similar to that, or an Inukshuk. Yeah, yeah, it could be either, really. Um, it was, I, honestly, I, I had just watched like a 15-minute YouTube clip on, um, like there, there are stones that you could you ring with hammers, and it sounds like music. And it was like, oh, that's neat. And then because I'm weird, it turned into some weird, creepy Halloween shit. <laughs> um, a, but yeah, so Stonehenge is not a bad idea. Is is not a bad thing. I am hesitant to. Uh, I I try not to use Anukshuk and stuff in my in my imagery because uh, it's not my culture, right. and I don't want to appropriate anyone else's culture, especially Indigenous folks, given how their culture was criminalized for Fair so enough. long. You know. <laughs> I don't know, but it could yes, fit into that. My family that. comes from the UK, so I'm allowed to use those. <laughs> but it could it could fit into that, is all I'm yeah, saying. Yeah, it, it could fit into there. Yeah, like uh, I've, I've, I've seen the tundra. It's not very tundra e where I live. I live in uh, in some rolling mountains, but I've, I've been to tundra, and it is a beautiful, beautiful place. There is a video on, and I'll try and find it for you, on YouTube. Um, and it's a cave of ice that a guy has turned into a stalactite uh, musical instrument. Oh, that would be amazing. I will try and find it for you and send it to you. But, yeah, it is absolutely amazing. 
Uh, pe- oh. People go up there just to listen to it. It sounds fantastic. It's all ice. Yeah. Oh, I- ice is amazing. Winter is my favorite season, which is good considering where I live. Considering where you live, yeah. <laughs> um, in closing, um, what would you? Yeah. Okay. What would you tell anyone? who might be too afraid to take the chance on being published. Do it anyway. <laughs> again, to again, I'm not into sports ball, but it is a great quote because it's true. You miss 100% of the shots that you don't take. If you don't put yourself out there, then you'll never get there. You'll never get, you'll never achieve your dreams if you're too afraid to try. I understand that that is, that is easier said than done. Right, like my, I I do understand that with my struggles with uh, with mental health and stuff. I have I, I have depression and I have anxiety. Both of them are severe. Do it anyway. It's it's if 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 you want to do it, do it. Life is short. We get one life. It is short. Do what makes you happy. If it if if that's what you want to do and that's what makes you happy, do it. Do it. Spend your life doing the things that make you happy that bring you joy. In 1983, in the Lower East Side of Vancouver, I was in a medical clinic, and there was a poster on the wall, and it was a cat hanging from a rope by one claw. And the caption said, if you have it in you to dream, you have it in you to succeed. Yes. And that has stuck with me almost, what, 40 years. Yep. Um, and And I totally believe it. Yep. 100%. 100%. Anyone can make it. It's, it's, it, it takes a lot of time and, and, and it takes a lot of effort. But hum, human beings are amazing things. We are, we are capable of so much. We are like nothing else, as far as we know, in the universe. Like we, we, we are amazing. We can do so much amazing. Oh, my dogs are singing outside. We can do so much amazing stuff. We just need to have the, 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 the will to do it, the drive to do it. And success is looks different for everybody. Exactly. Right? Like I my my definition of success is not, you know, become a award winning billion dollar having author. I that that's not what I want. I'm I'm happy in my shack in the woods. I just want people to read what I have and enjoy it. And that, to me, is success. If I can make some money at it, that's great. But that's a cherry on top. Absolutely. I just want people to. I just want people to read the things and enjoy them, just like I like reading other people's stuff and enjoy that. Absolutely, Storm. This has been fantastic. Um, we've we've been working back and forth trying to get this to happen for for a while now, and we yeah. finally were able to do it. And I feel like I've gotten to know you a little bit better and, and uh, certainly have been able to um, hear your talent. And it's, it's encouraging to me, and I'm sure that it's going to be encouraging to other people who are listening. So thank you for agreeing to come on and be a part of this, uh, this, this podcast. And uh, good luck to you in the future. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's been a wonderful opportunity, and it's been great fun chatting with you. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of Between the Lines. We hope you enjoyed our discussion and were inspired to either start writing or to keep on writing. If you have any comments, questions, or suggestions for future episodes or guests, you can reach out to us by sending an email to randy.btlpodcast at gmail.com use comment or suggestion in the subject line. For a copy of the transcript of this or any other episode, just send us an email using transcript as the subject line and indicate which season and episode you would like a transcript for. Visit my website, therandylacy.ca, where you can purchase one of my books, read my blog, and yes, even hear every episode of this podcast. If you have enjoyed what you've heard and would like to hear more, click the Buy Me a Coffee button at the top right corner of the page to help cover the costs associated with keeping this show available to you. 
If you're ever feeling overwhelmed by the many lions in your life, take a deep breath and remember the wise words of Winnie the Pooh. Sometimes the smallest things take up the most room in your heart. Until next time, keep on keeping between the lines.